we don't have to raise any alarms about this just yet, but I'm just, I'm just saying if Scott Derrickson makes another movie about dead kids, I might want to look into things. Good evening. My name's Evan and welcome to Rockland Graves. I was going to review the black phone today, but according to everyone over 40, I am completely unaware of any technology released prior to the year 2000 and thus will be entirely lost the whole movie as I won't understand why everyone's mad that their friend's phone number has three zeros in it. Where's the camera on this thing? Nope, fuck it. I'm still gonna give it a shot. I've said it a few times, but 2022 was one of the best years for horror that we've had in a long time. And one of the things that I've been really looking forward to doing is going back to reviewing movies that I maybe missed that year or didn't get to go super in depth on because I was leaving those videos spoiler free. I did review The Black Phone when it released, and if you haven't seen the movie and don't want it spoiled, that's the video you should be watching because I'll be spoiling the entire movie in this one. The Black Phone marks Scott Derrickson's first horror movie in nine years following the movie that many would consider to be one of the scariest films of all time. Sinister was a highly effective supernatural horror movie that definitely left its mark on the genre and the people who watched it, but Derrickson shifted focus away from horror for nearly a decade before teaming up with Blumhouse again. Prior to Sinister, he made The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which, for my money, is the only exorcism movie to rival... The Exorcist. Derrickson co-wrote Sinister with C. Robert Cargill, and the duo teamed up once again to adapt one of Joe Hill's short stories. It's about a 30-page read, and it's a very straightforward story about a young boy who's kidnapped by a killer clown, and there's a black phone in the basement through which this kid gets to speak with one of the previous victims of this killer. The adaptation was given an estimated budget of 16 to 18 million dollars, and production lasted from February through March 2021, primarily in North Carolina. In a year with so many fantastic horror films, The Black Phone really stood out to me, so let's dive into what makes this movie so damn great. I made you some breakfast. What did you put in that? Salt and pepper. One interesting thing to note before the movie even starts is that this was the first Blumhouse film to use the updated intro. I've got a lot of good memories associated with that original one, but the new one features a lot of cool easter eggs. You could frame by frame this and find something neat every few skips. God, I'm getting more and more nerdy by the day. The film opens with a minor league baseball game in Denver. Oh God. Come on, Denver! Get, Get the, the lead out! out. Do, Do not, not cross, cross the, the bad dad! dad. Right away, this movie establishes a really solid old-school tone through its visuals that stays consistent the whole way through. Most of the film was shot digitally and made to look more filmic in post, but there are a few sequences that were shot in 8mm film, and I'll talk more about those later. The Black Phone deals with some pretty heavy subject matter, and it wastes no time in letting you know that. Finney Blake is up to bat, but not up to snuff. Bruce Yamada hits a home run to end the game, and this young man is feeling the love. Man, your arm is mint. You almost had him. Good game. Good game. Look at this. The girls are all over him. He's got one hell of an arm. What a bright future this dude has. Oh, fuck. That, that, that might be fine. Okay, it's definitely not fine. Bruce is for sure dead. This isn't meant to be a jab at the rest of the movie, but I genuinely found the opening credits to be the most chilling moment. Mark Corvin's score over these 8mm shots of what looks like someone stalking kids and then showing missing person posters is absolutely chilling, but what else would you expect from Mark Corvin? You may not know his name, but you are probably familiar with his work because he's made some of the most harrowing soundscapes in horror over the last few years. He uses a very unorthodox custom instrument called the Apprehension Engine that uses things like metal rulers, springs, reverberant chambers, and a multitude of other things to create extremely bizarre and unsettling soundscapes. Scott Derrickson told Mark Corvin he wanted the score to sound like childhood fear, and uh, yeah, he hit the nail on the head. I love these weird instruments people are using to score films right now. The apprehension engine is incredible, and another example is Smile using that bizarre daxophone. <laughs> Keep it up, guys. Following that freaky opening credit sequence, we catch up with the Blake family, enjoying a wonderful all-American breakfast together. You think you can slurp that a little louder? I don't think they can hear you up in the Aww. 
There's a lot of time spent on building the dynamics in this family, and that side of things is handled really well. I'll be talking a lot more about the lead performances as things go on, but Jeremy Davies does a great job at playing this character that very easily could have been the archetypal alcoholic abusive father as a more grounded, conflicted character. He's a dirtbag, but there's more to it than that. The dynamics between characters are what makes this movie work so well. It doesn't take long before the sibling relationship between Finney and Gwen feels genuine. Madeline McGraw and Mason Thames just have really great chemistry, which goes a long way to selling that connection. It's confirmed that Bruce is indeed missing, and if you needed any more confirmation that this takes place in the 70s, here's a guy wearing a Cheech and Chong tank top and a headband named Robin beating up a guy named Moose who just called him a beaner. I am now completely immersed. If you've seen Sinister, you may remember that it was really fucking creepy, but you might have forgotten that a lot of the dialogue in that movie is super heavy exposition and was pretty on the nose. Enjoy, kids. I'm not likely to be able to eat out much this time. No, we haven't sold the old house yet. Once it's gone, we'll be able to afford a few extra things. That's something that persists into this movie, but it's the craft of everything surrounding the heavy-handed dialogue that saves it from turning into an eye-rolling simulator. Obviously, we need to be introduced to this world, its characters, and their role in the story, but I do wish there was a little more thought put into making these introductions smoother. It's apparent pretty quickly during this conversation between Finney and Gwen that sets up the grabber. You don't actually believe that story, do you? No. Because he can't hear you. He doesn't really take kids that safe. I know that. This kind of thing can be a double-edged sword. If you're someone who gets thrown off really easily by heavy-handed writing, then you're gonna tap out of this one pretty quickly. But the other side of that is the quicker we can set things up, the quicker the movie can get to the story playing out uninterrupted by needing to fill things out more. I'm able to forgive this kind of thing when it's used at the beginning of a movie to set the stage if the way things play out is satisfying. Finney is followed into the bathroom by a group of bullies, but thankfully our hero Robin shows up and scares them away. Fuck with Finn again. I fuck with you. You can leave now. If you didn't know, Joe Hill, the author of the short story, is Stephen King's son. If you're into King's writing at all, you'll know there's always some sort of vague mysticism baked into the world, even if the story being told isn't outwardly supernatural. I mention this because apparently Gwen has a bit of the shine. She's friends with Bruce Yamada's sister, and she had a dream about Bruce being kidnapped by a man in a black van with black balloons. There were black balloons found at the crime scene, but that information was never made public. Now, if you're like me and you were sad that Julian never got more time to shine after Halloween 2018, allow me to introduce you to Gwen. Yeah, I took him down, because obviously I'm the grabber, you dumb fucking fart knockers. Gwendolyn Blake! I love how even though this movie is dealing with really heavy, dark subject matter, it retains heart and humor without feeling dissonant. That can be a tough thing to pull off. Finney falls asleep watching the TV and is awoken to one of the most impressive examples of child acting I've seen in a long time. He hears commotion in the kitchen and finds his father whipping Gwen after she's been talking about the significance of the dream she's been having. I'm not gonna lie, I have teared up every time I've watched this scene. It's a genuinely upsetting sequence that is expertly acted. You are not your mother! That means you do not hear things they're not there! The panic in their voices, Gwen smashing the bottle of vodka, it's all so powerful. I am absolutely blown away by Madeline McGraw, and what's even more impressive than how genuinely scared she is, is the improvised switch to anger at the end of this scene. My dreams are just dreams! Say it again. My dreams are just dreams! This wasn't in the script, it wasn't an on-set instruction, this was just Madeline understanding the character she's playing and the situation that character is in. Fucking amazing. This is some talented family. Something that's alluded to in this scene is that Gwen and Finney's mother also seem to think that her dreams were not just dreams. This is later explored in a scene with Gwen and Terrence while he drunkenly tells Gwen about her mother's claims. Apparently, she was driven to suicide by apparent mental health problems, and it's left unanswered as to whether or not she actually did experience real visions or if it was just some form of psychosis. As soon as Gwen started saying things that reminded Terrence of how his wife used to talk, he became terrified that Gwen was going down the same path her mother did and lashed out. Obviously, it's absolutely awful that this happened, but I really love the way that the movie develops it because it makes it feel a lot more human. We get glimpses of Terrence's love for his children, like after Robin gets kidnapped and he's notified about it, you can see how upset he is that he has to tell Finney that he's gone missing. Do you know a kid named Robin? Are, 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 are... <sighs> 
It's a tragic and grounded family dynamic that really touched me. There's a powerful emotional edge that all of Derrickson's horror movies have. He's just really good at blending genuine emotionality in with horror. I'll have a bit more to say on that at the end of the movie, but let's move on. With Robin gone, Finney is attacked by the kids from earlier, but he's still not alone. Fucking cock-sucking cowards! <laughs> this fight is actually vicious as hell, but Finney's day is far from ruined by this thanks to this little interaction in class. Do you need a partner? Uh, no, no, I, I mean, yeah, I don't have a... Gwen, of course, takes full advantage of this development. Donna. Oh, Finney, Stop. will you be mine? We all know Finney's day is about to get a hell of a lot worse when he sees this van on the side of the road. The Grabber has become a bit of a Blumhouse icon since before the movie even came out since there was so much money put into marketing this movie. This was initially planned as a much more limited release, but because the movie tested so well, they decided to dump a lot more money into distribution and marketing, a lot of which focused very heavily on the really creepy look of the movie's villain. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to touch on the scene when Finney is kidnapped because it's done so well. On his walk home from school, a man comes out from behind a black van and drops his groceries along the sidewalk. We never fully see his face in a clear way. It's always either shot from behind, seen blurred, from a distance, or through a fence. In the short story, the killer is a clown, but Joe Hill said that in a post-it world, this character would work better as a magician. And I happen to agree with this change. I think that makes a lot of sense. Finney soon notices the black balloon in the back of the van, and before he can get away, the man knocks him out and throws him into the back. Ethan Hawke was initially hesitant to take the role. When someone plays a truly evil character, the mannerisms that they use in that performance can sometimes be forever associated with that evil character that they played. Hawk doesn't generally play villains for that reason, but the role was just too good to turn down. Whatever reasons he had, I'm so glad he wound up in the role because he's absolutely amazing. I'm 51 now and so... Uh, it might be the time for me to go to the dark side. He can't really use his face much to convey anything from the performance, so his line delivery was of the utmost importance. It varies from creepily playful to downright evil and can switch up in a heartbeat. I'm gonna go see who it is, then I'll get you a soda, then I'll come back and explain everything. It's a truly unhinged and disturbing performance, and it's elevated by the now iconic mask of the Grabber. Designed by the legendary Tom Savini and frequent collaborator Jason Baker, there were over 30 masks built for the production. The script called for old and cracked antique masks that would have a smiling variation and a frowning one. Baker had the idea of a third which had nothing covering the mouth, and a few other variations had to be built for stunt doubles and photo doubles because COVID guidelines meant no one could share masks. It's really hard to create a unique and memorable look for your horror villain these days. There have been so many iconic masks over the years, so it's hard to make something that doesn't feel derivative. With that in mind, the Grabber's Mask is certainly one that stands on its own and has solidified itself very quickly. It's a damn creepy look, and the different variations are used really effectively alongside Ethan Hawke's performance. If you weren't going to feed me, why'd you even come down here? Just to look at you. What I love so much about this character is you can never quite tell what he's thinking or what his intentions are. You don't have to be scared because nothing bad is going to happen here. Hey man, look, I appreciate that. I really do, my guy. But I'm not sure I trust that we have similar definitions of the word bad. One of my favorite elements of this movie is Finney's unwavering resolve in his escape attempts. He immediately begins searching for any possible vulnerabilities in the basement before he even sheds a tear. Any scene where he's trying to piece together a possible escape, I found to be incredibly engaging. It did a great job at hooking me in and investing me in the situation, and I found myself looking around for possible solutions every chance I got. It's like the world's worst escape room. I've gotten this far into the video without even mentioning the titular black phone, so Let's talk about it a bit. Just by the mattress Finney sleeps on, there is a black rotary phone mounted on the wall. It doesn't work. Not since I was a kid. There's something that I really like about a movie that sets up a simple situation and then embellishes on it. Finney has been kidnapped by the Grabber, who has been responsible for the abduction of numerous kids. There's a disconnected black phone on the wall, and there's something upstairs that keeps getting in the way of what the Grabber is trying to do. I gotta be upstairs for a while. 
Something's come up. Meanwhile, Finney's sister is trying to find him through visions she has in her dreams. I love this setup. It's a very simple premise with the abduction, but there's a lot of intrigue added to that simplicity that makes it a very tight, focused, and engaging movie. It's extremely well paced with each scene providing something new to keep the viewer locked in. Another thing that works really well is the quick shifts in tone the grabber takes. He feels really erratic, one moment sounding sadistically playful and the next straight up angry. If someone's upstairs, they'll hear me. No, he won't. Not with the door shut. No one can hear anything down here. I soundproofed it myself. Finney is playing the grabber's game here, and if he strays even slightly from the intended path, the man does not take it well. Derrickson is really good at building a sense of eerie mystery. It's been present in all of his horror movies, and I was really glad to see that built up again around the grabber. I mentioned earlier on that there are a few sequences that were shot on 8mm, so let's take a second to talk about why they were done that way. As I said earlier, Gwen has visions that reveal bits of information throughout the film. Visions in movies can be really cheesy, but this movie avoids that by executing them in a really cool way. They're mostly silent, and the jittery 8mm creates a dreamlike tone for these sequences. You can definitely tell Derrickson was a fan of this look after Sinister, and that's for good reason. These visions are generally quite short, but they'll reveal information about the the grabber's previous victims or help Gwen narrow down where she can find Finney. Part of this could be how much I like this execution in Sinister, but I'm a really big fan of how these scenes look. We already know that Gwen and Bruce are doing what they can, but each time the phone rings, Finney speaks with another one of the grabber's previous victims. There's a really neat detail where the longer the person is dead, the more they've forgotten about the life they lived. Bruce simply had to be reminded of his name, but the further down the line we get, the more confused and disoriented the kids get. Are you Griffin? Who? Griffin Stag. Probably. It's absolutely heartbreaking to hear these young kids talking like this, but even though they're all forgetting their short lives, each one of them is united by one goal, to help Finney escape the basement and kill the grabber. Now, one thing that I have always found to be a little silly and sinister is the look of the evil demon children, and that problem does occur in this movie as well. Seeing the kids this clearly takes away from the subtlety, which is one of the movie's biggest strengths, and I would have much preferred if we either didn't see them at all, or if they were shot in such a way that wasn't so matter-of-fact. Maybe see a slight shadow standing by the window lit by a streetlight, or standing out of focus somewhere else. This does happen at points, but I definitely find that there are moments where it's a little too in-your-face for my liking and can conflict with the movie's tone. Although it does give a tangible look at what the grabber is willing to do to these kids, which is pretty disturbing. The kids also aren't present for every one of the phone calls, and there are some pretty cool sequences that don't rely on the creepy kid standing behind Finney thing to stay engaging. At one point, Finney is warned that while the door was left unlocked, it's not a good idea to try and escape that way. Don't go upstairs. The grabber intentionally left it open, and he's testing Finney with a game called Naughty Boy. That's not how you play Naughty Boy. Finney does eventually try his luck, and thankfully the grabber is asleep when he does. This leads to probably the most suspenseful scene of the film, as Finney has to quietly sneak past and get to the front door. Earlier on, one of the kids told Finney which numbers were in the lock combination, but he couldn't remember the order they were in. It's the most tension-filled sequence of the movie, and Finney's trying every possible combination using the numbers the kid wrote on the wall. He finally gets the code right, but the noise of the lock opening up startles a dog, which wakes up the grabber. Finney makes a good shot at running away, but doesn't make it to safety in time. This movie naturally has a lot of really disturbing moments, but I think this bit where the grabber has Finney trapped on the ground might take the cake. And I will gut you like a pig right here in the street. I'm going to start talking about the ending now, so this is your final warning if you don't want to get that spoiled. There's one character I haven't even mentioned up until now, and his inclusion is the weakest part of the film in my opinion. Every now and then we see this coked out dude who's obsessed with the grabber's case. He's played by James Ranson, which is an automatic plus in my books because Deputy So-and-So is the greatest character in the history of cinema. I did see a small snake though. Snakes don't have feet. But scorpions have feet, but you wouldn't hear them like you would squirrels. It's revealed through an admittedly cool shot that he lives with the grabber, and we learn that he's actually the man's brother. He's not aware of what's going on in the basement, and he's really just here for some comic relief. Mr. It's Max. Mr. Max. No, it, I'm Mr. Max. It's just, it's just Max. My friends call me Max. The thing is, he doesn't do anything. He's just there to provide some levity, which Ranson's character in Sinister also did, but Deputy So-and-So was also integral to that film's plot by helping Ellison piece together the murders. Max is just really stupid. Stupid. Stupid moron. Sure, he's entertaining thanks to Ranson being a great character actor, but his actual role in the story is next to nothing and has no payoff. 
He eventually goes downstairs and gets killed almost immediately. His scenes are pretty jarring, and I think they hurt the overall pacing without contributing much of anything. He's here for comic relief and because the character was in the short story, but I think this should have either been entirely cut or done very differently. One other thing I want to mention is that there are a few moments that really break the subtle and grounded horror of this film. I'm curious if Derrickson was still in the mindset of making Marvel movies, because these sequences often use really obvious CGI that don't work very well within the context of this film. It thankfully doesn't happen too often, but that means when it does, it's all the more jarring. Things are looking pretty bleak for Finney at this point. He's tried so many things and been so close a few times, but just can't cross the finish line. I've talked a lot about emotionality in this video, and this scene coming up is one of the moments that hit me the hardest. Finney breaks down following yet another unsuccessful escape attempt, which is the first scene where we really see him succumb to the fear of what's going on. He's been down here for a long time, and while he's had lots of help, it's not looking good. This is when the phone rings yet again, and a familiar voice greets Finney. Hey Finn, what's happening? Robin fucking Arellano. Now, look, if you showed me this scene out of context, I would tell you it is the most corny bullshit I've ever seen. There's a strong build-up to this moment. Having Finney try so many things and work so hard only to reach this point of utter collapse and to have his only friend call him from beyond the grave to teach him to fight back and stand up for himself hit me hard. I'm with you. I've been with you this whole time. This wide shot of Robin running Finney through the steps over and over until you see in his body language that he's ready was really impactful. He builds his friend back up from the point of defeat, and the will to fight returns to Finney. They go through it a few times together and say their final goodbyes. This was the last call, Finn. Saw you from here on out. Time for this sick bastard to get what's coming. It's at this point that Gwen has managed to find the house she's been seeing in her visions, and she gets the cops to the house as quickly as possible. When they arrive, they find the house completely empty. It's an interesting moment, because the layout looks the same, but none of the decor we know is in the house is there. After Max is killed, it looks like the grabber is ready to take Finny out, but using everything he's learned from each of the phone calls, Finny bests the killer in a fight. I absolutely love that he uses every little piece of advice that was given and everything that was left behind by the other kids. He's been far from alone in this basement, and each one of the victims gets to have their revenge through their collective efforts. If there's one thing we know about horror villains, it's that if you need a moment to fuck them up, taking off their mask is sure to give you that opening. This is the case with the grabber as well, and Finney uses this opportunity to strangle the killer with the phone cord. Not sure if this would actually work, but I really like the symbolism of using the cord from the phone the kids talked through to kill him. There really wasn't a better way to do this thematically. The kids even get a last word with the grabber, and each one recontextualizes things they said to Finney before he ends the nightmare. I can't kill you, you hood puta, so Finn is gonna do it for me. Finn's arm is mint! <laughs> Back with the cops, just as they think Gwen was completely wrong about the house, they discover a basement full of the bodies of the missing kids. It's at this point that Finney walks out of the house, and it turns out that the grabber owned two houses. One was where he would hold and eventually kill the kids, and the other was where he stored the bodies. Here's another moment that if you showed me out of context, I would say is corny as hell, but it earns it through the buildup. Gwen sees Finney and runs at him for a slow motion hug while Mark Corvin once again shows he understands with absolutely no question how to evoke the emotion of a moment with music. In yet another moment that hits me like a truck, Terrence is reunited with the son he abused, who he thought he'd never see again, and begs for forgiveness. This is such an incredibly powerful moment, and all of the actors wear every unsaid word on their face. Terrence deeply regrets how he's acted and knows they have no reason to forgive him. Finney isn't sure if he's able to, and Gwen shows she wants to mend things when she lays her head on her brother's shoulder. Finney can stand on his own now, but I like to think things get better with this family. He's an absolute badass when he gets back to school, and he fulfills Robin's wishes when he dons the nickname he was given. Hi, Finney. I'm a fan. This movie presents an interesting spot for me. When I look at its individual elements on their own, it doesn't do anything particularly unique or groundbreaking. It's a very simple concept without any big twists. But the whole that this movie adds up to is such an emotionally engaging and impactful movie, and that's what makes it work so well. It's in the performances and the moments characters share together, and the unanswered questions by the end leave a lot of room for thought. The phone presents a lot of those questions, like why did the grabber not remove it when he very clearly made this room to be nothing more than a mattress and a toilet? What happened happened in the past that made him fear the phone ringing, and why the hell is he even doing any of this? There are no clear answers, and while it wouldn't surprise me if Blumhouse pushed for a sequel to this movie, 
I'm perfectly content to just speculate about these things. I'll have a lot of respect for them if they just leave this as a one-off, but I'm not naive enough to look past the financial success this thing was. No. In my opinion, this movie adds up to much more than the sum of its parts, and Derrickson is three for three for making great horror movies. I do think out of his three goes at the genre, this is his least scary of the bunch, but it would be really hard to pick which one I like the most. The Exorcism of Emily Rose, in my opinion, is one of the two best exorcism films of all time, and Sinister is one of the most terrifying movies I've ever seen. Thankfully, I don't have to pick, and I'll definitely be taking a look at those movies in the future and keeping a keen eye on any future horror projects Derrickson might be involved with. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.